It was November 18th, 1959, when this picture and the column by Noel Holmes appeared in the Auckland Star newspaper. As Noel Holmes wrote, they just up and built it. There are always some men about who are never able to realise that a job just might be too big for them, so they go ahead and do it anyway. I talked to a couple of such characters at the old Tikiwiti racecourse yesterday. Their line of endeavour was quite simple. Without any fuss or bother, they were placidly building a brand new aeroplane. From scratch. What Noel Holmes had discovered was this workshop in Tikiwiti, where a small but dedicated team of men were working on the construction of an aeroplane. And perhaps its main claim to fame is that this would be the first commercially produced aircraft to be designed and built in New Zealand. And it would also be the prototype for an aircraft of somewhat unconventional design. This ambitious project had its origin back in 1957 when Jack Worthington, manager of aerial top dressing firm Northern Air Services, talked with his chief engineer, Snow Bennett, about an unusual aircraft that had recently been designed and built in Australia. The aircraft which had inspired Jack Worthington was the PL-7, or Flying Tanker, brainchild of Italian-born designer Luigi Pellerini. So Snow Bennett and Jack Worthington made contact with Mr Pellerini, who agreed to design an aircraft that would meet their specific requirements for aerial top dressing. The use of aircraft in agriculture was a growing industry in New Zealand at the time. Since this would be Pellerini's 11th aircraft design, its initial designation was simply PL-11. It was some time later in an attempt to find a more user-friendly title for the aircraft, and since it was intended to be a sort of agricultural workhorse, that it became known as the air truck. Of course, one of the major considerations was a power plant, or an engine, for this aircraft. They needed something that was powerful, reliable, and readily available. When Snow Bennett discovered that a number of New Zealand Air Force war surplus Harvard aircraft were about to be sold by tender, he arranged for his newly formed company, Bennett Aviation, to put in a tender and buy as many of these aircraft as were available. He then contacted Luigi Pallarini, who agreed to design an aircraft that would use the 600 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engines from these aircraft. So in March 1959, a team of four, or maybe it was five, men from Bennett Aviation in Tikiwiti in the North Island travelled south to the New Zealand Air Force Base at Wigram, near Christchurch in the South Island. and within a couple of weeks they had removed the engines and tail sections from more than 40 aircraft. The intention was that the parts they needed would then be shipped to Raglan in the North Island and from there would be transported to Tikiwiti by road. The unwanted tail sections and wings were merely recycled as scrap metal. Pellerini had been asked to design an aircraft for aerial top dressing. Its primary function, therefore, would be to carry and distribute chemicals such as superphosphate and lime. So he started his design with a hopper capable of carrying 4,000 pounds, that's 1,800 kilograms, of granulated superphosphate. And if the thing was going to fly, it needed somewhere to mount the wings. and of course some wheels so it could move across the ground. We used the main wheels from those Harvard aircraft and some good strong attachment brackets so we could bolt an engine on at the front. 
The hopper, stub wing and attachment brackets were all made from steel and all welded together. So the heart of the PL11 was basically a large steel hopper on wheels with brackets to attach some wings and an engine. In this photo a time expired engine and cowling have been fitted to provide an accurate guide for the location of other parts. The fairing at the rear of the hopper was made from aluminium alloy and this compartment contained a seat for the loader driver so that he could travel to and from the work area in company with the pilot. Most of the wing structure was made from aluminium alloy. However, in order to simplify manufacture, Pallarini had chosen to make some of the intermediate wing ribs from welded steel tubing. The completed wing structure was then covered in aircraft fabric. The pilot's cockpit was custom made using aluminium alloy but a number of parts from those Harvard aircraft were included. The rudder pedals and brake system, engine controls, instrument panel and part of the canopy were all ex-Harvard parts. In his design parameters, Pellerini had been asked to address two problems that were characteristic of most aerial top dressing aircraft in use at the time. First was the problem of superphosphate dust getting into the rear fuselage. Superphosphate in water, from either rain or dew, creates a troublesome corrosive mixture. And with many top dressing aircraft, the rear fuselage had to be rebuilt or completely replaced every three or four years. This was a big factor in operating costs. So Pellerini simply dispensed with the rear fuselage and designed an aeroplane with two tailplanes, one on either side attached to the front and rear spar of each, each main wing at the midpoint of the wing. Secondly was a problem with aircraft such as the Piper Super Cub and Cessna 180 aircraft, many of which were being modified for aerial top dressing. With these aircraft, the hopper was mounted inside the cabin and behind the pilot. So the pilot was in danger of becoming like the meat in a sandwich if or when the cabin crumpled in the event of a crash. And if the hopper was placed in front of the pilot, as with the old Tiger Moth aircraft, which some companies were still using, the pilot would get a face full of whatever chemical had just been loaded when he opened the throttle for takeoff. So Pallarini attempted to overcome this problem by placing the pilot's cockpit on top of the hopper and forward of the hopper mouth. And this also gave the pilot a far better field of view than was possible from most other high-winged aircraft. This was now almost the end of October 1959, nearly two years since the start of this ambitious project. The next step was static load testing of the entire airframe. To achieve this, the engineers at HWM Engineering in the town of Tikiwiti had prepared a huge jig into which the almost complete aircraft was assembled, upside down. And so the airframe of the PL-11 was dismantled, taken in to the HWM facility in town and reassembled, upside down, in this jig. Eighteen tonnes of bagged cement were then loaded onto the wings and tailplane to simulate an in-flight load of five times the design maximum takeoff weight. Careful measurements of any movement of significant parts of the structure were taken before, during and after the load had been applied. 
This procedure was all meticulously monitored by Air Department engineers and by Pellerini himself. Some modification was needed on the stub wings in regard to torsion loads from the undercarriage in the event of an extremely heavy landing, but all the other tests simply proved that Luigi's calculations and expectations of deflection under load were correct. However, the Air Department engineers were being extremely cautious. They wanted some confirmation that those two separate tailplanes, supported on those long, narrow booms, would not start to flutter when the aircraft was in flight. So this would require some preliminary test flights before the real flight tests could begin in earnest. After a number of frustrating delays, this part of the testing was finally carried out on Wednesday 27th of April 1960. These preliminary tests consisted of a series of dummy takeoffs where the aircraft was held at flying speed just a few feet above the ground and then dropped back onto the ground while there was still sufficient runway ahead to come to a full stop. A movie camera equipped with a special wide angle lens was used to simultaneously film the two tailplanes and thus provide a visible record if there was any evidence of flutter. A special seat was made to fit inside the hopper so that photographer Nelson Irving could operate the camera as and when needed. Unfortunately, Pellerini was not able to witness this part of the test as he was in Australia at the time and too sick to travel. Nevertheless, he would have been pleased to learn that these tests showed there was not even a hint of flutter from those two tailplanes. Note the very definite thumbs up gesture from the pilot as he taxis in to park the aircraft. While the men who had fabricated and assembled the parts for this weird looking machine stood around and discussed the events of the day, the news media were anxious for interviews with the men who carried the responsibility for its successful completion. Jack Gardner, principal of the company, on the left, Chief Engineer Snow Bennett, and Test Pilot Johnny Johnson on the right of this photograph. The report in the New Zealand Herald, dated Thursday the 28th of April 1960, read, Two years hard work, perseverance and faith were rewarded at the Tikiwiti airfield yesterday when the staff of Bennett Aviation Limited, Tikiwiti, saw the new agricultural aircraft, the air truck, rise a few feet off the ground. The air truck is the first commercial aircraft to be designed and built in New Zealand. Designed for maximum load manoeuvrability on small airstrips, it will carry one and a half tonnes of fertiliser. But Air Department engineers were still not entirely happy. They had noticed that there was no shimmy dampener on the nose wheel assembly, an almost unheard of omission in their opinion. However, Luigi insisted that if the geometry of the design was right, then no shimmy dampener would be needed. The Air Department officers were not convinced, so they called for some fast taxiing tests to ensure that the nose wheel would not start to shimmy even under the most adverse circumstances. These tests showed no evidence of nose wheel shimmy. All in all, it was Tuesday the 2nd of August 1960 before the first real test flight was done. The pilot was Axel Neal, better known as Johnny Johnson. According to newspaper reports, shops emptied and even schoolrooms emptied as people rushed outside to look when they heard this unfamiliar noise as the new aircraft flew past the town. The flight, which was reported to have gone extremely well, lasted about 35 minutes.
The Taranaki Daily News of Wednesday, August 3rd, 1960, carried the headline, Tikuiti Plane Has Test Flight. The first aircraft of any size to be completely designed and built in New Zealand had its first flight at Tikuiti yesterday. It was in the air for 35 minutes. But the comment in the right-hand column about three more air trucks already in production was very misleading and not entirely true. There were only a very few minor items where we had made more than was needed for the first prototype machine. The flight on 2nd of August 1960 was only the first of many in a long series of test flights for the PL-11 prototype ZKBPV. But, contrary to Snow Bennett's expectation and to the enthusiastic newspaper reports, it was to be several years before the next PL-11 aircraft was finished and issued with a full certificate of airworthiness. Also, from August 1960, Luigi Pellerini was becoming more fully involved with the modification and design of other aircraft, and these were in Australia. Most notable was another new aircraft, which soon became known as the Transavia PL-12, a kind of little brother to the PL-11. And soon after this, Snow Bennett suffered a breakdown in health, and not only left Tikuiti, but he left New Zealand for a desperately needed holiday. The date for those final approvals just never seemed to be getting any closer. And with Bennett's departure from the team, the name of the company was changed to Waitomo Aircraft Company. So while prototype number one continued with its routine of tests, responsibility for the production of prototype number two and modification to prototype number one fell to Jeff Young an aeronautical engineer who had previously worked with the de Havilland Aircraft Company in England and had joined the Bennett Aviation staff in March 1960. It was thanks to Jeff Young's efforts that the PL-11 was eventually granted a certificate of airworthiness and a type certificate data sheet issued for the design. But that did not happen until April 1966, six years after the first prototype had first become airborne. In the meantime, the PL-11 prototype was permitted to do some productive work under an experimental license. The two pilots who flew the first PL-11 prototype, Johnny Johnson and Jack Worthington, both said that the aircraft handled very nicely. and from a work point of view, it was a remarkably efficient machine. Jeff Young did have to make a number of minor modifications to the PL-11. Perhaps the most noticeable was the nose strut. For this he turned to the same source of supply as Bennett had used for his aircraft engines. His final design for the nose gear made use of a main oleo strut from one of those Harvard aircraft. The aircraft was also given a different colour scheme one that was more consistent with the rest of the Northern Air Service's fleet. Don't be deceived by the dust cloud that trails behind the aircraft. The superphosphate for aerial top dressing was granulated and if you were on the ground directly under the sewing run it would have felt like a hailstorm. Unfortunately PL11 number 1 
ended its career on 8th of October 1963. The cause of the accident has never been determined for certain, but the most popular explanation has been that the pilot suffered a temporary blackout just after liftoff with a fully loaded aircraft. He woke up to find himself in the wreckage and has no memory of how he arrived there, but he certainly gave credit to the plane's design that he survived the crash. And the newspaper article read, Owes life to plane's design. A Tikiwiti top dressing pilot owes his life to the unconventional design of a plane which crashed at Napahinga, 23 miles west of Tikiwiti yesterday. Mr Jack Gardner, a director of both Waitomo Aircraft Company, which built the aircraft, and Northern Air Services, who operated it, said this last night. The pilot, Mr J Worthington, was admitted to Tikiwiti Hospital yesterday afternoon, suffering from head injuries and bruises to his chest after the plane crashed into a hillside at about 11.30 a.m. In spite of the enthusiasm and dedication of the men who worked on this project, and in spite of the number of potential orders from within New Zealand and overseas, Waitomo Aircraft Company were not able to get the financial backing they needed to commence full-scale production of the New Zealand-built PL-11 aircraft. This article, Bureaucracy Caused Aircraft Industry to Crash, comes from an undated Footprints of History magazine. Tikiwiti was justifiably excited in the mid-1950s when people believed they were seeing the establishment of an aircraft manufacturing business turning out purpose-built aircraft for the aerial top-dressing industry. The catalyst for this enterprise were decorated wartime airmen turned aerial top-dresser Flight Lieutenant John Worthington who sought something more efficient than the tiger moth he had been using in the Tikiwiti area. His partners in this enterprise were aircraft engineer Snow Bennett and Tikiwiti businessman Jack Gardner. Within two years they had designed, set up jigs and built the first of the unusual looking aircraft at Tikumi Aerodrome. But they, and the hopeful Tikiwiti leading citizens, saw the brilliant prospects for the aircraft building industry slowly die over the next eight years under the bureaucratic weight of what John Worthington calls the great clobbering machine of the New Zealand Air Department. That is how long it took to get a certificate of airworthiness for the air truck. Even then it was only with the help of the New South Wales Division of the Australian Air Department but by that time those who were involved in the enterprise had run up huge debts and could not carry on. In addition to Jack Worthington's complaint of long and expensive delays caused by bureaucracy, there were also rumours that aviation advisers to the New Zealand government of the time were not all without bias as some may have had vested interest in other companies that were selling aircraft for agricultural use. Snow Bennett and Johnny Johnson both eventually moved to Australia and worked with Luigi Pallarini on the development of the very successful Transavia PL-12. the story of Jeff Young's work in the development of PL-11 No. 2 and the necessary modifications for prototype No. 1 is probably every bit as courageous and stressful as it was for Snow Bennett and Luigi Pellerini. But that is all another story. And finally, a tribute to a man whose help made it all possible. Without his input, this whole project may have never progressed beyond the stage of an impossible dream. Without the financial backing of Tikiwiti Baker Jack Gardner, the air truck would have been nothing but a figment of aviation imagination. But Gardner's injection of $200,000 helped get the top dressing aircraft off the ground. Perhaps I should point out here that most of the work on the PL-11 air truck 
was completed before decimal currency was introduced into New Zealand. So Jack Gardner's contribution would be more correctly stated as £100,000. In 1965 you could buy a new Cessna 185 or a Fletcher top dressing aircraft for about £12,000. So if you compare these figures with today's prices you'll realise that Jack Gardner's contribution would be worth more than a million dollars in today's currency.